uh, spent a little bit of time covering uh, Zero Trust with Azure, including Azure Active Directory. And um, just a, a real quick note about me. Um, I am, or let me let me actually plug uh, my new company. I used to work with Robert Duvall at uh, Capgemini Group for almost nine years, um, focusing on identity security, application security, and uh, general cybersecurity. Uh, for the past uh, yeah, probably about five or so years at Capgemini, and then I uh, just recently switched over to Patriot Consulting. If you haven't heard about Patriot, uh, I'm not going to sell anything for you, but uh, we are one of the top Microsoft security-focused uh, firms in the country. Um, we rank up there one or two in terms of deployments of like uh, MDE or Defender for Endpoint, identity, uh, and so forth and so on. So uh, that's the company I work for now. And uh, a little bit about myself, um, about 20 plus years, gosh, probably getting close to 25 now. I've been around a few uh, few years, uh, IT consulting. I've uh, been working with Azure about as long as it has existed. So back uh, roughly 12 or 13, 14 years ago or something when it first uh, gave birth. Um, I was actually working with some projects on deploying solutions into Azure. Um, and then uh, been really working in uh, DevSecOps, like I said, with Capgemini Group and uh, now Patriot Consulting, um, helping uh, both uh, developers and uh, operations teams uh, get their DevSecOps working. Um, and that that's all about zero trust when it comes to the big picture. I've uh, been on the identity and Microsoft Identity Advisors team for several years. Um, and now with Patriot, I'm on quite a few other uh, uh, private teams with Microsoft product groups and engineering. Uh, one of the things that we do at Patriot is we do pro bono services uh, for tech and social impact, mostly helping nonprofits, de defending democracy program, and so forth, if you've heard about that. Um, so we've uh, currently served about 31 democracies uh, in the United States and other places. And uh, I am currently a, a co-author of my boss's book, my new boss, Securing Microsoft 365, second edition. So look for that. That'll be coming out soon. Um, Microsoft 365, as you probably know, uh, actually includes Azure Active Directory and spills over into the Azure world. Uh, pretty quickly there. So we'll be talking a little bit about that today. Um, and a little bit about my boss, who's Joe Stalker. He's one of the 20 uh, Microsoft MVPs uh, focused on security. So we are all completely focused, not just on any security, but Microsoft security. So not just Microsoft 365, but uh, I now head the Azure security practice at, at Patriot. So enough plugging our company, a uh, little bit about uh, Defending Democracy Program. If you're interested in that, just let me know in the chat or uh, after the presentation. Uh, share these links with you. Uh, so let's dive into Zero Trust. Uh, and I'm going to try to monitor the chat too in case anybody has any questions. I can watch the chat for you too. So. Oh, great. Yeah, just let me know if you see anything that... Uh, it's answering. Yeah. All right. So zero trust. What the heck is it? All right. So zero trust is not a thing in terms of a product or a set of products or anything like that. A lot of times you will actually hear about that from certain vendors, like they're going to sell you a zero trust solution. But that's not what it is. Now, let's just start back a little bit. The traditional model, okay, so we used to say that the corporate network was secured. So if you connected a device to the corporate network inside, that we could trust you quite a bit, right? We still had users authenticating with passwords, God forbid, and things like that. But you were pretty well trusted, right? Um, 
the problem was is the walls were our perimeter. All right. Anything out the outside the walls, we didn't really trust very well. Um, but the problem is with that approach is the bad guys are already inside the walls. <laughs> so we needed a better way of actually handling and approaching this general problem. What do we do? What do we do if the bad guys come inside the walls, whether they're using Trojans or whatever? Um, so today's model, especially after COVID and work from home, and all the type of rapid accelerating, uh, you know, adjustments that we had to make to this new world. Um, we have people working from home office like I am, uh, for example, at Patriot, we are 100% remote. Um, we do not uh, come into any office now. Um, we have SaaS applications um, authenticating their own way or maybe SSOing to your identity provider. We have IoT devices. We have all this stuff going on, um, and there is no real such thing anymore as the corporate network. And even if we do have that and still have that as kind of our bastion, we really can't trust folks inside that uh, corps, folks or things for that matter inside that corporate network. So this is all part of the deperimeterization, big fancy word. Um, which is one of the, the kind of key concepts to, uh, to zero trust. It's not the only one. There's some other things that we want to talk about when we're talking about zero trust. So again, it's not a product. It's not a set of products. It's not necessarily even technologies that we, or it's, it's a methodology or um, a framework of, of actually making decisions and better securing your uh, digital estate. All right, so let's move right along. Now, NIST, if you're familiar with NIST, um, they are the, uh, if you will, kind of the nonpartisan, uh, non-vendor uh, authoritative group uh, when it comes to standards and so forth, especially in the United States. And um, these are the three principles of zero trust per NIST, okay? Number one, we verify the user, okay? We validate the device. And one of the things I'll say in this talk is devices have identities. So we are all familiar with users having identities, but devices also have identities too. Can't forget that. What do we do when we have all of these crazy different types of devices coming in and trying to access our resources. Do we just shut them out or do we try to build a trust to those devices and the users on those devices appropriately? <clears throat> and finally, NIST says limit access, all right? So limited privilege or least privilege. And, um, uh, you know, limit that access. So those are things like just in time or just enough access, especially for privileged accounts like IT admins and so forth. Now, when we move on to Microsoft, now what do they say? No, well, they have three principles as well, and they're very similar to NIST. So verify explicitly. So what they're saying is you always authenticate and authorize check permissions based on all signals for both users and devices. So NIST kind of separated those users and devices, but Microsoft is just saying, and I really do agree with him, is both users and devices have identities. So for example, a, a device identity would be, is it hybrid joined? Or is it only Active Directory joined? Okay, that's where we start with device identity. That's where we start by saying, hmm, can I trust this user because they're on a non-joined device? So let's keep going. Um, use least privileged access. So never you know, be lazy and apply uh, too much access to specially sensitive uh, resources and so forth. So use those things like JIT and GIA 
uh, privilege identity management, PIM, PIM PAM. Uh, and, uh, and then something that may be new to you, but it's been around a few years, especially in the Microsoft ecosystem, is risk-based adaptive policies in data protection. So what we mean by when we see that word adaptive, uh, especially when you're talking about zero trust, is that we want to adapt to changing conditions. Users may move around. Users may connect with different devices. Applications may change. An application may change from something that is not so sensitive to now this application is sensitive. So adaptive policies are actually able to adapt to those changing conditions um, to help build that trust over time. And then, of course, last but not least, always assume breach. Assume that the bad guys are inside the walls. Um, never trust anybody or anything unless you can build that trust based on signals, okay? So a little bit about how zero trust actually works. If we had a person that said, I want that, okay? The first thing that we do is we authenticate them. And we don't care if they're inside the corporate network or not. This can happen with the internet. It can happen from their ISP at home. Phones on mobile networks, doesn't matter. IoT device out in the field, doesn't matter, okay? Um, we need to authenticate you as a person or you as a thing, all right? So the policy says, if you were able to talk, says, hey, show me your ID. So that person is known, and then we ask, how or can I trust this person? Yes or no, all right? And then we move on to are you actually accessing a medium value, high value, or low value piece of data or asset? All right. So we have kind of an alignment between the authentication, who are you, show me your ID. Then we start moving to building trust. Okay. So we ask, what do you want to do with that medium value, high value, or low value asset on the right side? then that is the authorization. What permissions do they have, right? And then is that information super sensitive? Then I better have a lot of trust on that identity. Do they have a fake ID? Is this the really the person they say they are? Do I need to automatically adapt because they're suddenly coming from an ID, a location or a pattern that I've never seen before so I'm gonna automatically MFA that person. Okay, so what we're doing is we're kind of building trust as we go through this. And then we continuously monitor because things change over time. Users change over time. Applications change over time. The value of that data, the sensitivity of that data or application changes over time. So we continue to do that. It's not a one and done thing, okay? So the real, the real message here in zero trust is really zero assumption trust. I almost always like to use that phrase. It's not that we're never trusting, it's that we never assume trust, okay? So again, a little bit more of what that might look at. Now, if you were to take, say an authentication request, right? I need to get to something. What you want to do is tune your policies so that a, say, a business critical uh, asset or piece of data out here on the right requires a lot of trust. By golly, they better be MFA'd. Uh, they better not be, you know, uh, exhibiting. Um, uh, high risk activity, maybe there was some activity in the previous 24 hours that caused that identity or user account to um, kind of shift into a more uh, risky state. So that's one of the things that Azure Active Directory can do is actually track those things and use AI to help build that trust automatically without uh, human beings.
uh, getting too involved in it. But you set your policy so that you say, maybe if it's a low impact, we're going to want that much trust. But man, if it's a high impact, we want this much trust. Okay, I'm going to ratchet up. If you're going to access a asset that's considered to be a, a high impact there. And then finally, the, the business critical, super high, right? We want to get that, make sure that, no, maybe maybe we get to the point where we say, they don't even need a pass. We're completely passwordless. In order for you to actually access that bit of business critical resource, you have to have authenticated and maybe even MFA'd um, and then not even used a password whatsoever. Password rules is a real thing. All right. So that's the trust versus impact. That's a real important message in the whole zero trust uh, message and uh, way about going going forward on this. But zero trust, by the way, is not about locking down the security man for, so that everybody. Uh, is is really slowed down or really is hassled by extra uh, authentication prompts and so forth. When you implement it correctly, and this can be done in the Microsoft ecosystem, um, it increases security and then it increases productivity. Now, how does it do that? So number one, increases security. It's all clear, pretty clear about what that, how that works. Um, but you could actually um, have more control of the security and how people are accessing your data. You're not assuming certain things uh, that may or may not be true. Um, one of the nice things is there's no blind spots for remote devices. So if you deploy, for example, MDE, um, you have a really good picture of what these devices are, whether they're mobile or computers or whatever. Um, and then even for servers on the back end, if you deploy Defender for Cloud um, protection for servers, you have even more information about when one server talks to another in your environment, when we don't care if it's in the cloud or on-prem, um, we have more telemetry, we have more information about how to trust that connection okay, and that authentication. Um, and uh, increases productivity. One of the big ones is that uh, you could kill the VPN. Um, zero trust, one of, the, one of the big benefits of that is you could start to phase out VPN. Now, how can that be? I've got a bunch of legacy applications sitting in Azure or on-prem, and, um, and they are so dumb that they can't figure out how to authenticate um, unless I'm coming across SSO and doing all that traditional type of legacy authentication. Well, with Azure Active Directory, you can actually set up app proxy so that you can take those legacy applications um, and make them such that on the front end, you kind of put a wrapper around that application. And on the front end, it's using modern authentication that's MFA and all these signals uh, compliant, if you will. Um, but then authenticates with that legacy on the back end through that private connection. So um, there's literally no excuse to have VPN in zero trust, no excuse to have VPN. So VPN goes away. Um, if you have ADFS, Active Directory Federation Service, no excuse for that anymore. We don't need that for legacy. And uh, it's one of the others that I usually talk about. Um, and any other kind of legacy um, authentication, um, such as uh, uh, NTLM. Here, let me uh, fix that. So NTLM is a favorite of attackers to um, exploit. Uh, and if they get inside, they have a field day with NTLM because there's all kinds of issues with NTLM. We'll get into the details of that, but um, you could essentially start to phase that out and then eventually um, watch for NTLM authentications on your network and uh, do away with those. 
So in terms of increasing security, you get rid of these legacy systems, and that generally will increase productivity. Uh, users love it. Um, it's a it's a great uh, benefit, not just for security, but uh, for productivity as well. All right, so one more thing kind of conceptually here is that um, Microsoft and most others have these what we call pillars of zero trust. Think of these as kind of sources of information that can help you build trust while your systems are authenticating, authorizing, and so forth. Okay. So first one, identity. Um, many people like think that zero trust is all about identity and that's it. They kind of stop there, right? Um, identity is a big part of it. You may have heard identity is the new security perimeter, which means we don't trust those firewalls. We know that the bad guys could get across firewalls. Even insider threats, your own employees are inside that firewall. Okay, so that we can no longer trust that because insider threats are a big deal these days. Um, there's a hope, by the way, there's a whole ecosystem of attacker uh, economies, if you will, that actually try to buy FTEs to help them exploit certain targeted companies. Um, and there's been a few uh, famous uh, incidents of that in the news recently where uh, this breach happened because a FTE or contractor was literally bought and paid for by an attacker to be on the inside and as actually act as a uh, inside threat. So those organizations really may not have had, and almost all of them seem to have not had a good mature zero trust strategy. So just wanted to call that out. Identity, a uh, big part of it, but that's not it. We've got five other things here that we look at. So devices and endpoints, we talk about devices, uh, what health are they are, they end, are they updated, uh, uh, antivirus good, um, do they have uh, good, uh, suitable attack surface? Again, it's all part of your, your trust tuning that you do with your zero trust journey is that you decide, hey, if these devices don't have Android 12 or Android 11 or whatever it might be, then we're not going to allow them to connect to this particular asset. All right. Also, applications. So applications are talking to other applications in today's world. Okay. We had that in the old days, but we have that a lot these days where we'll have say we went out and bought an application, deployed it, and turns out they rely on yet another service or application that needs to securely authenticate. Um, so there has to be a trust established there as well. A lot of times those apps um, are acting as an identity as well, like perhaps uh, like a delegated uh, authentication where an application is, is identifying itself a certain way, then the application itself is really uh, acting as, as an identity. So all three of these things here um, are almost always in my mind kind of go together in terms of identity. We have users, we all understand that, but devices have identities and apps have identities. Then when we talk about infrastructure, we're talking about networking um, uh, and these things together, uh, these two usually. And then data is, okay, do I have PCI data? Do I have security classified data? Um, what is the impact of that data if that were breached? So we have all six of these signals to kind of um, mix together in a recipe for uh, zero trust, okay? A quick word about uh, this thing that Microsoft calls the intelligent security graph, they're in a unique position in the market um, to actually uh, monitor 200 plus cloud and other services and applications that they uh, currently operate as a business. 
that's a lot of telemetry. And the more telemetry we have, the better the AI, the artificial intelligence is to actually detect anomalies. Um, when they're geopolitical events, like we saw back in like February, uh, there was a lot of activity that they were detecting and then publicly reporting out to the community through their threat intelligence on, uh, you know, look out for these things. We're seeing this. You know, a lot of security researchers and firms do that. But Microsoft's is very interesting inside position that they have because they have such a coverage of, you know, billion plus users of Windows, Office 365, and now Azure. Xbox, you name it, all these services that they run, 200 plus of them, um, are all generating telemetry that they analyze and make available out to you to help build trust in a very adaptive way when you're uh, putting it all together in your strategy. So uh, interesting thing about Microsoft's position in the market there. All right, so this slide right here is pretty much the map of everything that is zero trust, especially in Microsoft, okay? Um, I might come, come back to this slide, um, but if you were to print out anything and make a poster of it, and stick it up on your wall, this would probably be it. And this, this chart or this diagram has evolved a little bit, but not much, you know, again, this is a methodology so the truth of the principles that we're following here are quite constant. You know, they don't change too much. So on the left side here, we have things that are all really around uh, identity. One second here. Let me uh, fix my slides here. Hold on. There we go. Got it. So on the left side here, we have identities. And I lost my pen. Hold on a second here. All right, let's go back. All right, so we have identities. We have endpoints or devices. We use those words term, uh, interchangeably. So everything on this diagram on this left side here is really around identities. What can we do about building trust with identities? We could ensure strong authentication. We could do things like ensure that those passwords haven't been leaked to known uh, repositories of breached uh, credentials. Um, we could look at device compliance, you know, is this in you set your compliance? So um, that device identity can be compliant. Uh, we could also say, is that personal device compliant? We could set a different threshold for personally owned devices. Um, then what we do is we assess the risk of that. Now in the middle here, if we kind of draw maybe about right here, um, this is all about making decisions, okay? How, how are we going to trust that authentication device, application, whatever it might be, okay? So up here at the top, we have policy optimization. So we have organizational um, policies, like we all get together and non-technically define, okay, what kind of governance are we going to have around this? Do we do business in North Korea? Okay, no, we don't. Well, then we are never going to accept any kind of connection or authentication requests from North Korea. North Korea, done, okay? Um, you pick your different compliance levels, okay? So if you have, say, credit card processing then you're familiar with PCI compliance, right? And, uh, you know, so those systems are all separated, treated appropriate sensitivity out there. But you define that compliance level here. Um, then uh, you always continuously monitor your security, a posture management assessment. So those are things like secure score that you've probably heard of in Azure. We'll take a few of these things. 
uh, and then uh, ultimately monitor productivity optimization. You know, are we impacting productivity? What risks are we going to take um, on those uh, those choices that we make that might impact productivity? Okay, so we may decide to take a security risk to boost productivity to a certain point uh, until we figure out a better way, or maybe do a user education series on uh, how to better authenticate with, uh, say, MFA or whatever. Then we have zero trust policies here in the middle, and those usually come in the form of uh, conditional access policies. So we're putting all of these signals together. Um, and actually creating policies that authenticate, help authenticate, and evaluate that trust here um, when that happens. Uh, and then down here at the bottom where, um, in threat protection, we have um, ongoing assessments of threats in the environment. We have new threat intelligence that's coming in from external sources. Um, we, we might have some forensics if we had a, an incident breach or something, have some forensics and uh, learned uh, some lessons from that. Um, and then we always try to automate the response to threats. So we want to keep that what's called dwell time in your environment very low. All right. So dwell time is how long were the bad guys inside the wall before you were able to detect that they were actually there and operating. Okay. So when um, our different systems that we're going to go through and that are available in Azure, especially Defender for Cloud, a little bit Sentinel, they can actually automatically respond to things um, based on how you tune it. And then finally, on the right side over here, we have the enforcement. And this is where rubber hits the road. This is where we start adapting our network. We start adapted, adapting access to applications, whether they're outside some SaaS application, say Salesforce or whatever, outside of our app. We can control and adaptively adjust access to those applications if you set it up correctly in a zero trust principled way. Um, again, uh, data, you know, for example, emails and documents, that's usually Microsoft 365, Office 365 environments or other environments. Could be uh, file, file storage, you know, maybe even Azure storage accounts. Uh, and then structured data is, you know, databases and so forth. We want to classify, label, and, and encrypt appropriately that data. Okay. Um, and then finally, in the infrastructure part, which is probably down here at the lower right part. What we want to do is use all those tools that are available to us in terms of privileged identity management um, or privileged access management, PAM. Um, we turn, turn on just-in-time capabilities and just enough access. So that's JIT and GIA. All of these guys here, like serverless, and this is just a few of the capabilities that Azure actually provides, but uh, serverless and containers and so forth. All of these now have the ability to look at Azure Active Directory and use all of this other stuff that's happening over here on the left side and to make decisions based on what's happening. All right, so there's a lot going on that slide and I'll take a, a breath here if anybody has any quick questions. Derek, you see anything? Yeah, when uh, Jim, uh, you said uh, VPN is nice to have when Azure AD goes down. Yeah, no kidding. Boy, those of us who have uh, experienced some of those AED outages, and not many of them have happened recently, but boy, there were some good ones uh, a few years ago. Um, and uh, like, for example, I'm down here in Texas and we had some storms uh, that took out South Central. Uh, that really shouldn't have taken out South Central Azure, but uh, that's uh, Northwest San Antonio, not too far away from where I am. 
and uh, but there was some cascading events and so forth, and you guys were familiar with the root cause analysis of that. Uh, uh, but it's very rare that AAD goes down because after those incidents a few years ago, the whole product team got together um, and uh, led by our hero, Mark Rasinovich, uh, the CTO of Azure, and uh, they all got together and said, we've got to fix this. And yeah, there have been a few light incidents, but I cannot remember any serious time where Azure AD completely went down um, in the last couple of years. Now, they usually happen in a very uh, uh, kind of specific way, you know, in various regions might um, suffer some latency and so forth. But um, uh, personally, I haven't experienced an AAD outage and I use it bazillions of times a day, you know, uh, over the past few years. So. And being an identity and monitor that pretty quickly. The identity team, uh, which uh, was very focused on resiliency of AAD. In fact, they re-architected some things over the COVID time. It's rare that doesn't come down. All right, so let's move on. So again, zero assumption to trust Archer architecture like I like to use. It's all about how can I build trust across my environment? It's not that we're never going to trust. We never assume to trust. And how can I appropriately build the level of trust um, so I can um, uh, build a better secure environment? All right, so let's go through each of these offerings. Now there's a bunch of Microsoft components that we could use to bolster our zero trust strategy. But I'm gonna, I picked uh, just a, a few, uh, and hopefully we won't run out of time. I'll zip through these. Um, and some of these uh, products like Defender for Identity are baked into things like Microsoft 365 Defender. So um, Defender for Identity is really an interesting product. So when we talk about the identity parts of this, um, we have this complex uh, security landscape, especially with identity. We've got all these identities and Again, most of our clients are multi-cloud, uh, and I'm not talking about just SaaS applications. I'm talking about they use AWS, Azure, and even uh, Oracle Cloud, um, and, and uh, lots of different identities to, to keep track of there. And then we've got bring your own devices and, and so forth. So, uh, and not just cloud, but legacy infrastructure, you know, on-prem stuff. So uh, Defender for Identity, and this is a little salesy here, but um, it's it's important to remind ourselves that Defender for Identity is not limited to uh, the Microsoft ecosystem. It can protect other um, parts of your ecosystem, even on-prem, even ADFS. So if you still have ADFS running, um, you could actually bring ADFS into the measure. So some real quick things, get, just diving into the details, uh, just three examples of how security posture, remember, we're trying to build trust. So let's say we have some legacy application here on the right that is actually still using clear text uh, passwords. So LDAP is a common culprit, all right? We have some applications out there and the vendor says, well, you need to connect to LDAP and here, create a service account and store the password here and uh, we'll authenticate to LDAP. Well, LDAP is hot, hot, working over three, 389 and it's not necessarily encrypting that traffic. So again, we don't trust what's inside the, the, the walls. The bad guys are already in uh, or insider threats are already in. So um, these legacy protocols um, can really be trouble, troublesome. Even over here on the right, you know, uh, NTLM, um, all kinds of issues with that NTLM, like I told you before. So um, identity or defender for identity, or Defender for Identity can actually um, listen for and call out these things that are happening in your environment. It's on-prem, in Microsoft Azure, or somewhere else. Um, another one is, you know, uh, hackers love this, is where you have unconstrained delegation rights. So when you have a situation where 
um, say an application might have, or maybe even a developer has gotten kind of lazy and said, well, we're just going to do this to authenticate. It's going to use Kerberos, um, but Kerberos can use uh, uh, computer delegation for any service. So, um, and that is something that if attacker got control of that particular device uh, or computer that uh, it could actually take advantage of this weakness. So again, Defender for Identity can actually uh, hunt these things down, and, uh, help you uh, find them, take action, or appropriately build trust if you need to keep these. All right. So any questions about that so far? I'm going to zip through these Defender for Identity um, ideas here. So. Um, classic thing um, inactive or expired accounts attackers love those they love because they get fly under the radar a little bit if they can get an account or an identity and say active directory that is no longer in use or expired they they can actually they like to use those accounts because they usually don't show up on your radar for other monitoring activities so one of the other things that Defender for Identity can do is actually go and discover all those, make sure you have good inventory of these to make decisions. So if there's an expired account, it should never be uh, requesting uh, SSPR or uh, any kind of authentication request. If you see that and the account's expired, of course it's not gonna work, but that's activity you need to keep an eye on and, um, and then of course uh, not trust it. So, and then uh, Defender for Identity, of course, can help you um, take action on those things. Our friend LAPS, uh, so if you guys are into uh, local administrator uh, accounts and how you could actually cycle the, uh, uh, the credentials for local administrators on, say, workstations, and, and um, you could actually uh, hunt down and see those devices that don't use LAPS. Now, why are we so concerned about LAPS? Well, one of the easiest and most common ways that attackers can uh, essentially harvest all the credentials in your AD directory is by, say, pass the hash. So if you have an administrator that is authenticated into a, say, endpoint workstation, some user's computer out there, it can scrape all of the hashes for the uh, administrative accounts that have logged in to that computer. Um, and that allows them to traverse or um, laterally move across your network. So LAPS is a great uh, uh, way to actually uh, mitigate that risk so that your local administrator password is, for example, shared across um, thousands of workstations, for example. Right, so um, unsecure Kerberos delegation, we talked a little bit about that before where you might have uh, too much uh, computer delegation on Kerberos tickets. And uh, so uh, Defender for Identity can hunt that down. Um, again, all this is running in Azure, so this is all cloud-based. Um, and uh, in order to get visibility into, say, legacy systems, you do deploy agents out to systems so that you get visibility to things like uh, Kerberos delegation. Um, so let's move on. So that was Defender for Identity. Those are all the things that you can leverage as part of your identity strategy for uh, Zero Trust. So let's move on to another one. Another one I picked was Defender for Cloud. This is a monster. Um, remember that Defender for Cloud used to be called uh, Azure let's see, Advanced Threat Protection or uh, Azure. I don't remember the names now. <laughs> it's been it's been almost a year, I think, uh, when they all renamed these. Uh, but Defender for Cloud is not just Microsoft. It's on-prem, multi-cloud, XDR. Okay. So, um, and this is just a quick snippet of what kind of protection do I get with Defender for Cloud? Okay, so in Azure, you've got these resources. Any VM uh, 
containers. This is uh, this changed uh, relatively recently. It used to be um, uh, separated into two plans. Now it's one that they call Azure Containers. Um, Azure App Services. So if you've got web services that are running in Azure uh, on their PaaS platform, uh, that could be protected there. Azure SQL, Azure Storage, Synapse, um, SQL MI, um, and uh, of course Azure SQL over here on the left, and then managed instances of uh, SQL and Azure Files, uh, Postgres, uh, MySQL, and MariaDB. These are all open source. Uh, these need to be running on Azure, so just to be clear. Um, and then, of course, IoT. There's Defender for IoT, but uh, Defender for Cloud can actually reach into IoT. And then currently in public preview is Cosmos DB. Now, you may see some uh, resource types here that might be missing. And the uh, Defender for Cloud team is uh, actively working on additional uh, workloads. Um, both uh, Azure only and hybrid. Now down here at the bottom, we have um, Azure service layer uh, oriented uh, services. So all of these are general availability. Uh, so we have uh, uh, network layer, um, Key Vault. So you could actually have Defender for Cloud watch Key Vault and, uh, and raise alerts in and adjust that trust as people are actually or things, lots of applications access Key Vault. So you can adaptively adjust that trust level uh, for act accessing Key Vault. Key Vault is something that is frequently uh, turned on when it comes to Finner for Cloud because it holds the crown jewels often. Uh, and then just management, Azure management, uh, itself. So that's ARM. So uh, Defender for Cloud can actually protect ARM. Now, what does that mean? Well, when I'm interacting with ARM, I could actually um, uh, be, uh, my trust can adjust according to how I'm interacting with ARM, whether it's through PowerShell, Terraform, infrastructure as code, portal, whatever it might be. Um, Defender for Cloud can definitely protect that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Azure DNS as well. All right, zipping right along. Ramesh, did you have a question about Sentinel or? Uh... I'll assume not, maybe. All yeah, right, so when we're thinking. And that was uh, what it used to be called with Azure Sentinel, where they renamed it, right? Oh, Defender for Cloud? Yeah, I thought Sentinel was the old name. I don't know. Microsoft, uh, no, well, they're Sentinel, as good at naming things as they are renaming things. No, I know. Sentinel hasn't changed. So Sentinel changed from Azure Sentinel to Microsoft Sentinel last year. Still the same product, um, not part of Defender for Cloud. But when we talk about XDR, extended uh, detection response in our security landscape, we include Sentinel in that. So Sentinel is a SIM sort. You know, all of your telemetry of your environments are all coming into something like a SIM and a security event management uh, platform. That's what Sentinel is, cloud native, hyperscale, all that good stuff. Um, and then Defender for Cloud and Microsoft 365 Defender um, are all capable of feeding into that as your whole XDR solution. So uh, sometimes you kind of hear zero trust in XDR. XDR is one of the, say, tool kits, if you will, to enable zero trust. I might have a slide later that kind of illustrates that. Conceptually. So anyway, let's uh, get back into the Defender for Cloud, though. Uh, Sentinel is not part of the Defender for Cloud, um, but it definitely integrates with it as part of XDR. So um, on the left side, we are uh, strengthening our multi-cloud security posture. So we are looking at Secure Score. I'm, I assume that you guys know about Secure Score. Uh, and then 
Uh, so I won't go into that too much, but uh, policies and compliance like, okay, we need Federant moderate or we need uh, uh, PCI DSS 321 because we do credit card processing. Uh, or we need uh, some of the other uh, compliance standards uh, that are present around the world. Um, those help build your security, but they're not the whole picture, of course, when it comes to compliance. You don't stop when you're compliant, in other words. Uh, and of course, we always try to improve the automation on that. So when we take a look at just that left side here, um, the, the components that we have to help us with zero trust, um, really are around posture management, right? What we're trying to do is like reduce attack surface, reduce vulnerabilities, so forth and so on. We always like to have regulatory compliance over here on the right side as part of that. So now one of the common misconceptions about Defender for Cloud is that um, you can get uh, compliance for free. And yes, that's true, but only for this guy right here, Azure Security Benchmark. These, like ISO 27001, CMC, which is Department of Defense, Military Contractor sort of, uh, Compliance, and SWIFT is financial. Um, in this example here, there's a, about a dozen more compliance standards that are built into Defender for Cloud that you could turn on. Those down here at the bottom are not free. So you have to enable Defender for Cloud in your Azure tenant. Uh, associate that with subscriptions, okay? And then, or AWS accounts, the kind of the equivalents with that, or GCP projects, okay? So AWS and GCP, we can talk to those directly because we can, Defender for Cloud can actually work directly with those. Um, um, we need to enable all of this in order to get that additional, additional uh, compliance standards. So for, so again, this one right ha here is free. You could turn that on today in your tenant. Sorry about my handwriting. Uh, if you want to go beyond that and have it go check for additional things, this is plus dollars, okay? But this is great stuff. Our clients, we always turn this on. Big bang for your buck, okay? Especially if they, and they almost always have some kind of compliance standard that they're trying to meet. Healthcare, HIPAA, uh, government, usually FedRAMP. And so forth and so on. So, PCI. So, um, it gives you visibility what's going on. Okay. And as resources are added to your subscriptions, resource groups, and so forth, you have policies that automatically detect that and then say, hey, Defender, we've got this new resource. Go ahead and add it to your inventory. So, it's a great way to not only get a comprehensive security posture. Uh, but also uh, see how you're doing on regulatory compliance over here. Um, so moving on, uh, this is what the dashboard looks like, in case you haven't already seen that. Um, really good, helpful visually. Um, I'm going to move on from that. Inventory, so uh, it will actually look at your entire inventory, and that's not just VMs, the screenshot seems to show that all these guys are VMs, but it could go out and actually look at all kinds of devices. Uh, I had a client once that when we turned this on, they were surprised to see that, wow, it discovered all my Cisco switches that are 15 years old out there on my sites. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, not just VMs, of course, and servers and so forth. Um, and the really neat thing about this approach that they take with Defender for Cloud is that as you're trying to build your policies for trust, you could use the Azure Resource Graph. And I'd love, I'd love to do a uh, a session with you guys um, on this because I find that a lot of Azure admins don't necessarily know about the Azure Resource Graph. 
um, but it's a way that you can actually really get into the nuts and bolts of your data in your environment. Um, either for reporting or visibility or threat hunting if you're a security person. So, um, so anyway, let's move on. Um, here's an example of how you can jump into KQL here down at the bottom where you can uh, custom create your queries, share those with the resources organization, uh, and then actually automatically take action based on the results of these queries with tools like even Sentinel, right? So uh, Sentinel can actually execute playbooks, which are based on logic apps, uh, to take action on something if it sees query results that don't look good. Um, so, uh, and then uh, Defender for Cloud can definitely uh, integrate uh, many other third-party and uh, on Microsoft uh, uh, systems. Uh, Checkpoint Firewall, one example there, Cisco and so forth. Lots of big vendors here that you can actually bring in that telemetry for Defender for Cloud and uh, extend that protection out to those, uh, those systems. All right, it's all about building the trust. It's about identity, both users, devices and so forth. And when it all comes down to it, this is a high level picture, you know, secure score. I think you guys are familiar with this, but secure score gives you the big picture of what, uh, how you're doing overall. Uh, and then you can take action on this. So this is um, a uh, uh, UI for pretty decent. What I usually do with security recommendations, I can use this, but I will KQL that out into formats either my clients need or I need um, for recommendations. So all this data, this rich data here is available to you through Azure Resource Graph. Um, and then you can remediate. So you can actually take action on those things. Um, so for example, um, right here, the quick fix logic, if, um, if it's available for that particular type of thing, like endpoint protection, this example should be installed on endpoints, then um, you could actually uh, just click a button and start the process of actually remediating that on not just one, but all of the devices that fall under this alert that Defender for Cloud is seeing. Again, building trust, right? We're getting everybody up, everything up to the point of where we can have better trust as uh, they're authenticating. And of course, you continuously monitor all those recommendations and take action on those. Um, one, one interesting thing here from a security standpoint is the MITRE attack tactics and techniques. Um, if you're familiar with that framework, that is not a Microsoft thing, but Microsoft borrows heavily on that when you look at Defender for Cloud, is um, if you see things that should not be trusted, um, they could associate that with the MITRE attack tactics and techniques. Um, as kind of a way to enrich your decision, uh, these things that you will find in the recommendations. So you may decide, well, you know, we're okay, we're okay to accept that risk, or oh no, I didn't realize that that's a tactic and technique that's uh, commonly known for this uh, vulnerability. Uh, then finally, um, when we're talking about hybrid, again, GCP, AWS, on-prem, all of these things are not left out. They're part of the zero trust. Bring them in and have Defender for Cloud uh, managing that. And then for the full XDR picture, here's Defender for Cloud right there. So we just talked about uh, Defender for Identity. We could say that's that square right there. Uh, and this whole thing, now Microsoft draws this box right here, kind of they imply that XDR is just those two things. But uh, generally, most of us in the organization say, no, XDR is this whole thing. It includes your sensor, which in the Microsoft world is Sentinel. So all of these things together, you have full visibility to building trust with uh, with uh, your zero trust. And finally, not but lastly, not least, not last but not least, uh, purview. 
um, really a uh, nice little bundling of things that we've had uh, all along, and Microsoft gives it a name. Now, back to our trust versus impact, we have to determine how sensitive is this data? Well, Purview wraps together all these nice feature of detecting and identifying sensitive data in cloud resources. So when you have deployed Defender for Cloud with Purview, it can actually go out and figure out where the sensitive data is, and then you could pick and choose whether that's right or not, and then classify those. So you could say this is highly confidential, or this is confidential, but all employees, or this is classified and labeled as secret. So um, these are our storage accounts right here, as you could see in this example, but the SQL server here doesn't have any classification yet, and so forth in the example. So think of Purview as the way to actually bring together that data sensitivity back into your zero trust uh, picture. And uh, finally, um, when you put all these things together with Azure and Azure Active Directory and uh, Defender for Identity and Defender for Cloud, um, and, and then identify that sensitive data with Purview, um, you could actually build that trust across your environment and adapt to changing conditions um, and uh, then kill the VPN, kill that ADFS and uh, get rid of all those legacy protocols. How about that? <laughs> all right, well, that's about it. Um, and uh, I'd like to uh, shamelessly plug some other webinars that we'll be doing at Patriot Consulting. Um, we've got some really good stuff called our summer uh, series of webinars coming out. Some of these I'll be presenting um, and we'll actually dive into XDR, for example, like this one here, I'll be doing this with a colleague and so forth. So um, if you're interested in compliance, uh, that webinar there on the left is a good one. Uh, we've got people on staff that are focused only on compliance and then Microsoft ecosystem. So. Check that out. I will share this in the chat. And uh, do we have any other questions? Yeah, any questions for you for your time? Go ahead and stop the recording. I think I ran a